Stand By Me has a lot to say about childhood friends, the impact of family relationships, and growing up. So how did a film made in the mid-80s that's set in the late 50s prove to be a timeless masterpiece? I'm Jonathan Hederly, and this is Psych Cinema Quarantine Edition. I'm starting a series within a series, kind of like a dream within a dream, called The Films That Shaped My Love of Cinema. I'm looking back on the pivotal films that, in addition to just being great works of cinema, have a strong personal connection to me. And I cannot think of a better film to kick off this series and stand by me. I was 12 going on 13 the first time I saw a dead human being. It happened in the summer of 1959, a long time ago, but only if you measure in terms of years. That's Gordy Lachance narrating the first lines of Stand By Me. So I was 12 going on 13 the first time I saw Stand By Me. It wasn't the first R-rated film I'd watched because I was a big fan of 80s Schwarzenegger flicks. Get to the chopper! But it was the first serious R-rated film. It's based on the short story The Body by Stephen King. Now director Rob Reiner crafted a 90 minute film packed with more honesty, emotion, and truth than most films can muster in twice that running time. But Stand By Me is more than just a film when I first watched it. It was like watching my childhood play out on screen. The film provided me language to connect to my own turmoil and fear I was enduring at that early stage of life. The story is framed around Gordy Lachance, played by Will Wheaton, the central character and narrator who reflects back on Labor Day weekend 1959 in the small town of Castle Rock, Oregon. He and his three best friends, lovable goofball Vern Tessio, played by Jerry O'Connell, volatile Teddy Duchamp, played by Corey Feldman, and the sensitive but tough Chris Chambers, the late River Phoenix. The four 12-year-old buddies decide to take a hike along the train tracks into the countryside in search of the body of a missing boy likely hit and killed by a train. The journey gives way to an exploration on mortality, friendship, and the scary shift from grade school to junior high. Stand By Me is eerily accurate and autobiographical. So recent appraisals of the film have lauded at how well it is aged and stood the test of time. Simply put, the film is just as good, if not better, after all these years. And credit should start with director Rob Reiner, who wisely employed child actors who were the age of the characters and therefore looked the part and talked the way normal 12-year-old boys spoke to one another. The amount of profanity may shock some adults, but crass and profane dialogue was not foreign to me. By the time I saw the film in 1988, this 12 year old had regularly dabbled in smoking cigarettes. My dad had a taste for Marlboro unfiltered. Uh, I had already consumed alcohol. I discovered very early on that I did not like tequila. And shoplifting was something that was of some regular habit for me. I mean, how else was I going to finance my baseball card collection? Now, some could argue that I was out of control, or others may remark I was not properly supervised. All I know is that when I watch the campfire scene when the boys remark, Nothing like a smoke after a meal. Yeah, I cherish these moments. I understood their sentiments. And yet, despite the mature subject matter and behaviors, the film spends ample time reminding the viewer that they are still kids, who still have their moments of absurdity often associated with childhood. Like the philosophical question, Do you think Mighty Mouse can beat Superman? Now, the film's honest touch must also be credited to the author of its source material. Stephen King has spoken about the autobiographical nature of the film. He reflected on his own childhood experiences, stating, I was prey to a lot of conflicting emotions as a child. I had friends and all that, but I often felt unhappy and different. I was terrified and fascinated by death, death in general, and my own in particular. The film also provided autobiographical aspects for some of the actors as well. Will Wheaton has stated all four actors at the time were very much like the characters they were portraying. He himself has often spoke about his own anxiety, shyness, and awkwardness he experienced as a kid. Will Wheaton also remembers Corey Feldman's cruelty towards him to the point that both River Phoenix and Rob Reiner had to intervene and tell Corey to lay off Will. The hardest role to fill was Corey Feldman's Teddy Duchamp because the casting director had difficulty finding a child actor who could come across that angry. Now, Corey Feldman had commented that his personal life was so tumultuous 
and abusive that he didn't have difficulty tapping into any emotional space to portray Teddy. So why do I hold Stand By Me in such high regard? Because it's a film that portrays boys showing vulnerability with one another. Stand By Me showed the space where naivete makes way for the terrible truths of the grown-up world. Gordy asks Chris, Do you think I'm weird? Definitely. No, man, seriously. Am I weird? Yeah, but so what? Everybody's weird. Chris and Gordy worry about growing up and what it'll mean for their friendship. Gordy, recognizing that Chris knows him better than his parents, fears that they will grow apart and fade out of each other's lives. But Chris encourages Gordy to excel in his life without consideration to him or his parents. Stand By Me became a classic because it understood the shifting landscape of late childhood into early adolescence. I mean, how many films show kids to be scared, insecure, and damaged like many are in real life? The film really highlights that we don't get to choose our parents. The topic of family, and parents in particular, is central to the film. Up to that point in my young life, I hadn't been exposed to a, a film or story that was a commentary on my own life. Stand By Me provided language and emotions to own my story. I'm a child of adoption, a Korean kid raised by a Caucasian family, and a child of divorce. I would not have been able to verbalize it at the time, but it was clear I was filled with sadness, worry, and anger at my young age. And like many kids, and like the character of Teddy, I buried my emotions with the facade of humor. I became a jokester. And I found solidarity with Teddy, Chris, and Gordy. I understood how the actions of parents profoundly impact the lives of their children. Beneath Teddy's playful demeanor is a rage that is easily triggered. And although his trauma has been at the hands of his father, Teddy is not capable of reconciling the image of a heroic war veteran for the mentally ill abusive man that mutilated his ear in what is implied to be a post-traumatic fit. In a scene that is both touching and disturbing, Teddy flips out when the junkyard man trashes his dad, calling him a loony. Chris likewise struggles with the expectations that are assigned to him by virtue of his family reputation. Known as a family full of crooks and booze hounds, Chris tearfully confesses his pain that by virtue of his name, people will assume the worst of him or assume the worst to come from him. When River Phoenix delivered his sorrowful monologue, it registered with my own shame and embarrassment. I was extremely self-conscious after my parents' divorce and my family's socioeconomic status. Now, I may have identified with Teddy's volatility, but it was Gordy's relationship with his family that struck a nerve. Now, my family did not experience the trauma of the death of a family member, but it did experience the loss and grief associated with a broken family. My older brother went to live with my father and both gradually faded away and out of my life to the point where, like Gordy, he feels unimportant and in invisible to his father. Gordy struggles with his father underappreciating and ignoring him. He can't make sense of his own grief and having never cried at his brother's funeral, he's driven to go find and see the dead body of Ray Brower. And by the end of the film, Gordy not only achieved what he set out to do, but he has the perspective that whatever neglect he has experienced at the hands of his father is not his doing, but his father's issue. And so we look at this changing child of growing up in the 50s, growing up in the 80s, or growing up in the 21st century. Because many years removed from my childhood days, I'm now a licensed psychotherapist. I work with young guys, many who encounter social struggles and the inevitable changes that come with life. They range from middle school age to their late 20s. Some guys I work with have started college, others have relocated for work. But all are tackling change, and they all in some fashion are scared and unsure of themselves. So was my childhood unique? Have things always been hard for young guys? Or has friendship for boys changed over time? It's probably not an either-or scenario. I mean, certainly a lot has changed in our culture since the mid-80s when I grew up, and even more so since the late 50s. But different times, there are still the same hopes, fears, and insecurities. So what does this all mean? Nothing except that each generation has a set of challenges they face in early adolescence. And each generation is rewarded with opportunities that may not exist for others in different eras. Watching Stand By Me is an invitation to reflect on my own childhood experiences, the good and the bad. I'm watching my own children grow up in very different times, but the prospect of growing up is always in some way scary. 
and the power of friends and the pain of family can stay with you long after they cease to be a part of your daily life. Gordy's final words summarize the specialness of that time in one's life. I never had friends later on like the ones I had when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? Thanks for watching. Be sure to share your thoughts on what makes Stand By Me so special, or tell me what film captures the essence of your childhood. Until next time, I'm Jonathan Hederly. Please take care of yourself. Be smart. Be safe. We're all in this together, and together we're going to get through this. So, until next time, I won't see you at the movies because you need to stay the f*** home.